Hello again, I'm Sam B. Hansen. Today I'm going to be talking about Johann Sebastian Bach's Goldberg variations, which date from the 1740s, the early 1740s, when Bach was in the last decade of his life. What I'm going to do is pick a few of the variations and talk about what makes them so clever and how Bach has gone about putting the piece together. To start with, I'm going to play you the aria, which is the theme on which the whole piece is based. Bach places the aria at the beginning and the end of the whole piece, and in between he writes 30 variations on the aria, or perhaps more properly, on the bass line or the harmony of the aria. Here's variation one as an example, and although you'll hear that the character of the music in variation one is quite different to the aria, it's much more lively, the overall harmony that Bach uses is essentially the same. Some of the variations are written with particular characters or styles in mind. For example, variation 7 is a little jig.
One of the things that Bach is renowned for is his ability at writing fugue. Now a fugue is a piece that's built on a single melody called the subject. You hear that subject at the beginning and you hear it again and again throughout the piece in different keys whilst also being combined with other melodies. If I give you an example, uh, this is a fugue in G minor for, for the organ written by Bach. Uh, the subject is this. That's the end of the subject, and then the right hand continues on a different tune, and the left hand brings the subject in as a, what we call an answer in a different key, but the same tune. And on and on it goes. Variation 10 of the Goldberg variations is a fugetta, which is simply a, a little fugue. I've been playing so far on the piano, but Bach originally wrote the Goldberg variations for the much more established harpsichord, the piano only just being in the early stages of development in the 18th century, um, and more specifically for a two-manual harpsichord. That's a harpsichord with two keyboards, and we can see here a picture of the harpsichord that I played in 2016 at Arts University Bournemouth. Uh, for a complete performance of the Goldberg Variations. This harpsichord, they'd just acquired it at the university at the time. It was restored by Andrew Bellis, and this is a photo by Josh Parker. The reason he wrote it for two-manual harpsichord partly is that certain variations have a solo-slash-accompaniment role, so it's good. The two manuals will have two slightly different sounds, two slightly different sets of strings, and so the player can solo out one hand whilst the other hand provides an accompanying role. But the other reason, the other main reason, is that there are certain variations where the hands cross over, and although this can be done on the piano, and it often is done on the piano, it's often performed on the piano, it's more convenient if you've got two different keyboards to play on, um, which is why the harpsichord is, is particularly ideal for this piece. Now, alas, I don't have a harpsichord, but I do have two keyboards. I've got down here the Nord Stage 2 EX, which you've seen me playing in all my videos so far, and up here the Korg M50, which I've had since 2009 and has done me really well. And I've set them both to two slightly different harpsichord sounds. And I'm going to use them now to show you variation 26 to demonstrate all the hand crossing excitement.
Now in that variation there I used two eight foot stops, what we call eight foot stops, um, a stop being a set of strings on the harpsichord, on a real harpsichord, or also on the organ a set of pipes. And the name stop comes from the switch that turns that set of strings off, stopping the sound. An eight foot refers to piano pitch, standard piano pitch. So if I play middle C on an eight foot stop, I get exactly middle C. If you halve the length of the set of strings, the sound goes up by an octave. So therefore a four foot stop would sound an octave higher than an eight foot stop. And there's middle C again, eight foot, four foot would sound like that, the same note. If I put them together, I get eight and four, Hopefully there you can hear there are two octaves at the same, it's as if I'm doing this, but I'm only playing the one note. And the advantage of that is that I can get a much bigger sound. There's eight and four. Here's just eight. A bit more sedate, perhaps. Um, now I can use eight and four to advantage in some of the more declamatory variations. In variation 16, Bach writes an overture to the second half of the piece, as if to announce, here it is, we're halfway there. This is the beginning of the second half of the piece, and that works quite well using eight and four foot stops. I'm going to talk now about one of the main structural features of the Goldberg variations, and that is that every third variation, Bach writes a canon. A canon is the same as a round, really. It's where you've got one tune, a single tune, that works in imitation with itself while the original statement of the tune is still going. So there's a, an initial statement of a tune, the leader, if you like, and then the tune restarts itself on top of the original statement of the tune, we could call that the follower. Frere Jacques is, a, is an example of that. If I play the leader down here and the follower up here. tune twice at two different times. London's Burning is another uh, example of that, there are various others as well, um, including Soft Kitty from American sitcom The Big Bang Theory, which some of you might have heard before, some of you might need to go and look that one up. Anyway, those were all examples of canons at the unison, where the follower starts on the same note as the leader. And variation three in the Bach, which is the first canon in the piece, is also a canon at the unison. We can see the first few bars here of variation three. We've got two staves, a right-hand stave at the top and a left-hand stave underneath. And the original melody, the leader, here is in blue. And you can see the blue note all the way through the, the top stave. And that sounds like this.
and the follower is shown here in green notes and if you look carefully hopefully you can see that the green notes are exactly the same as the blue ones but they start a bar later than the blue ones and if I play them together blue and green they sound like this And underneath all this, Bach writes a separate bass part for the left hand, and that's shown in the black notes on the lower stave. That sounds like this. And it all comes together like this. The second canon to appear in the piece is Variation 6, and Bach here adds an extra dimension to the music by writing a canon at the second. And a second in this case is a type of interval, an interval being the difference in pitch between two notes, which on the written page would appear as the vertical distance between two notes. Now we can see here a series of intervals that are increasing in size, starting with the unison at the left where two notes are the same. We could also call that a first, if you like. Thereafter, you measure an interval by calling the lower note number one and counting upwards until you reach the higher note. So a second would involve perhaps just the, two, the first two notes of a scale, which might sound like this. A third would involve three notes, and then, and so on. You know, the fourth, the fifth, sixth, seventh, and the eighth has a special name, octave, because it involves two notes that share the same letter name. Now, what does this have to do with the Bach? Here's the beginning of the music of Variation 6. Again, we can see the, the right-hand stave at the top and the left-hand stave at the bottom. The leader, again, is shown in blue, and that sounds like this. And once again, the follower is shown here in green, starting a bar after the leader, shown in blue. And again, it's all the same notes, except that this time they start a second higher than the leader. They're a step higher. All the notes are a step higher than the, than the blue notes. And the follower on its own sounds like this. Now, if we put those two elements together, they sound like this. and it all comes together very beautifully. Now that probably wouldn't work so well with Frère Jacques. Anyway, here's variation six, including the bass part in the left hand.
Now this pattern of canons every third variation continues through the piece, but in the canons at the fourth and the fifth, which are variations 12 and 15, Bach goes one stage further still by inverting the canon. Here's the beginning of variation 15. Again, as usual, we have the leader here in blue notes. I'll just demonstrate that. And the follower in green here starts, as the title would suggest, a fifth above the leader in blue. There's the sound of the fifth. But in this case, the follower is a mirror image of the leader. Whenever the blue tune goes down, the green tune goes up by the same distance and vice versa. Here's the follower on its own. And when we put them together, it sounds like this. And once again, there's a separate bass part for the left hand to play as well. Most of the Goldberg variations are written in G major. This is one of only three variations in the whole piece, which is written in G minor. The last variation I want to show you in this video today is the last canon that appears in the piece, the canon at the ninth, variation 27. You might think variation 30 ought to be the canon at the tenth, but Bach gives that special treatment as what's known as a quadlibet, 
which was a collection, um, a sort of mashup, if you like, of popular tunes of the day, which probably would have caused a few giggles in the audience in Bach's time. Anyway, here's the beginning of Variation 27, the Canon at the Ninth. Again, we can see here the leader in blue and the follower in green. And the follower, the green tune, is a ninth above the leader in blue. Here's the interval of a ninth. Now, unlike the canons at the fourth and the fifth, there's no inversion here. Whenever the leader goes up, the follower goes up as well. They're all going the same direction all the time. But the the special thing about this canon is that, as you can see here, there are no black notes. There's no separate bass part. It's just the leader and its follower. And the significance of this is that not only has Bach managed to write a tune that works in canon with itself for the ninth time in this piece, but this tune also functions as its own bass part. All the music that we hear in this variation is built from a single line of notes. I hope that's given you an idea of what there is to explore in this piece. Of course, there are 21 other variations that I haven't covered in this video today. Um, if you did want to go and listen to the whole thing, which of course I'd encourage, um, there are a couple of uh, recordings I'd like to highlight. Um, if you prefer the piano sound, I've been listening to Andrei Gavrilov, uh, his complete recording, which is with repeats. Um, the idea in each variation is that each half of each variation is repeated, which of course doubles the length of the whole piece. And if you if you do it that way, it takes about an hour and 20 minutes to get through the whole thing, which is quite a meditative experience. It sounds like a long time, but it, it is quite powerful. Um, and it's I, I come out of it feeling quite centered, um, particularly when listening to his recording. There's a picture of him on the front, sat backwards on a chair with pages of Bach flying around his head. Um, so that's good fun. Or if you prefer the harpsichord sound, I've been listening to Ralph Kirkpatrick, um, the American harpsichordist. Uh, he plays it without repeats, so it lasts just over 40 minutes. And it sounds as though he's got access on his harpsichord to possibly a 16 and 2 foot stop. 16 foot would sound an octave lower than piano pitch, and 2 foot, which is very rare, would sound 2 octaves higher. Um, at least that's what I can hear from the, the sound, the, 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 the size of the sound that he gets out of his instrument and the variety of different what we call registrations, combinations of stops that he uses in his recording. Both of those are on Spotify. Um, next week, which will be Friday the 3rd of July 2020, I'm going to play one of the movements of Ravel's Mother Goose Suite arranged in its arrangement for piano solo as opposed to piano duet. Um, the week after that, Friday the 10th, the plan at the moment is to have a virtual jazz trio performance. More about that next week. Um, but for now, um, as always, thanks for watching. Have a good week. <laughs>